A huge thank you to all the super sponsors who make it possible for me to make these videos. Visit David X Newton on Patreon to join the ASCII Brigade. At this point, we've defined our new orb object and its behaviour, we've got monsters to drop them according to their general toughness, we've got a count of them on screen, so let's make them do something useful. How about letting the player heal themselves with a button press when they've collected enough of them? Player input is another area that Zscript handles with event listeners. The Events and Handlers page tells us the input process function is called whenever there's input to be handled, and that a healthy six pieces of data are passed to it. We want to identify when the input event matches the one we are listening for, and once we receive an event like this we want to allow the player to exchange orbs for health if they have a sufficient number of them. There's actually a short way and a long way to set up a reaction to a button press. I'm going to go the long way first so that you can see the entire process, then I'll show you how to cut it down to just what's necessary. In Zscript we don't look for specific key presses happening directly, instead we want to go through GZDoom's control system so we can allow for the user to customise their inputs. GZDoom provides four special built-in keys for mods to use for their own controls. These are called Weapon State 1-4 to in the Controls menu because they were initially imagined as controls to modify the behaviour of weapons, and internally they can be referred to as the more generic names User1 to User4. So let's implement a second function in the orb UI handler, this time overriding the input process function which takes an input event called E. We're going to ask the bindings object to get us information about the control configurations. Unfortunately no documentation for it seems to be available at the moment, so I'm just copying the style of how it's done in the source code here. We want the bindings global to get us the keys that correspond to the command user1. Unusually this get keys for command function returns two ints because the gzdoom configuration supports up to two binds for the same control. Now we want to check if we have a match. If the input event's key scan is equal to either the bind1 or bind2 values that we retrieved, and the input event is of type key down, then we want to react to it here. We are checking specifically for it being a key down event because we only want this to happen once per key press. For now, as usual, let's just use console.printf to verify that something's happened. The last thing we do in this function is return false. Unlike every other event function we've used so far, this one returns a boolean value. The internal function in gzdoom that calls input process looks for this to decide whether to continue calling other event handlers for this event. If true is returned then the game will consider the input event as handled, and it won't ask anything else to do anything about it. This is useful in situations like a modal dialog box or an inventory screen where you might want to use the player movement keys to navigate a cursor around, but then block the game from reacting to them as well and moving the player around. A good example of this is in the conversation menu class's menu event function, which will return true if the key press was one that the menu understood and reacted to. So load up the project again and make sure you have one or more keys bound to user1, which is weapon state 1 in the controls menu, and you should be able to get this message to appear by pressing them. With all of that working it seems straightforward enough to write our real action. We've used all these elements before and we just need to retrieve the player and fiddle with their inventory a bit. If the player has 20 or more doom orbs when either of these keys are pressed, we're going to give them 10 health bonus items and subtract 20 doom orbs. You can, of course, decide on the quantities of orbs required and the health or other items to give back for yourself. While we're at it, we'll add a sound effect as well. Functions from Decorate, like A Start Sound, still exist in Zscript, and they can be used on the player like the other functions. The MISC P Pickup sound is the sound defined in GZDoom PK3's sound info to mean the gong like power up sound. So let's try running and testing this, and we hit another roadblock. Welcome to the world of scope. The concepts around scope are described in the Object Scopes and Versions page on the Zdoom wiki. This is something that I hadn't encountered in the coding world I live in, which is all dull back-end business software, but it's an important thing to get your head around when you're dealing with a game world. Code in GZDoom, like in our event handler and thinkers, can be assigned one of three scopes. The error message calls this a context, and I prefer this word, but the wiki is fairly insistent that it's wrong. The three possible scopes are play, UI, and data. They exist to make sure that the state of the game stays consistent, especially when playing on a network, and that you're not modifying any data where you shouldn't be and making the game unstable. In our case, the objects that make up the game world are said to be in the play scope, and when we're in an event handler function that deals with user interface concerns like drawing things to the screen or handling input, we're in the UI scope. 
From the UI scope you can read freely from the play scope, like we did when we put the counter on the screen, but you can't modify it. Only other things in the play scope are allowed to do that. The section on networking in the Events and Handlers page tells us what to do here. Instead of trying to alter the player's inventory directly because of a UI event, we're going to send out an event of our own that tells the play scope that we want something to happen. The code to do this is simply event handler .send network event, and we'll call our event orb recharge. So now all our input process function does is listen for the keys that cause the command user1 and send a network event when it happens. Now we need to set up the other side by writing a function that will listen for this event and react to it. We do this in network process, which is another function that's available to event handlers, and this one is in the play scope. The distinction between network process and input process isn't very clear from down here in our event handler, but this is how they're defined in the base static event handler class. By default, the class and its elements are in the play scope, but any function defined with the UI keyword, like the input process function, is considered in the UI scope. A few videos down the line we'll be using this technique for ourselves. Despite the network process function existing in the play scope and not the UI one, I still like to put it in the UI event handler if it's dealing with events that come from the UI. But you can decide if you prefer making a separate event handler for it. The network process function receives a console event, and we want to check if its name is equal to the one that we expect. Note that unlike almost everything else in the GZ Doom world, the names of the network events are case sensitive. Once we know we've received an event called orb recharge, we want to implement the same code that we had last time. We get the player's inventory, and if they have enough orbs we subtract, we add, we play the sound effect. Do notice though that the way we retrieve the player pawn from an event is a little different here. This time, instead of using the console player global, the event has a property called player that identifies the player that activated this event. We only want to recharge the health of the player that requested it. In multiplayer Doom each instance of the game is running its own play sim, and they each need to do exactly the same thing to their copy of the game. If we used console player here like we did before, then whenever the orb recharge event was activated by any player, each individual copy would apply the change to its own console player and the game would go out of sync. Having satisfied all the scope requirements, when you start this up you should now find that you can press the user1 key to swap orbs for health. The separation between taking input and acting on it also makes things testable. You can send an event from the console to be picked up by network process functions by using the net event console command, much like using the mysteriously named puke name command for ACS. In our case, typing net event orb recharge will cause the orb recharge event to happen. And here, having completed the long route, we can talk about the faster way of setting up a control to listen to. GZ Doom allows new controls to be specified in the keyconf lump, which as usual has its own ZDoom wiki page. I won't go over it in great detail here, but in just a couple of lines we can set up a new configurable control that will specifically run the command net event orb recharge when it's activated. By going this route we don't need to have the input process function, because GZ Doom will catch the control itself and send the net event for us. Therefore we just need to write the reaction to the net event in the network process function. Nevertheless, knowing how input process works can be useful when you want to filter controls in specific contexts like conversations and other modal dialogues. The Doom orbs now have a purpose, and we have a small but basically complete mod using Zscript. There's still a lot to explore though, and next time we'll look at a bit more of what Zscript can do with regard to manipulating objects in the game world.